Let me say, in getting started, how thankful I am to be here to share a burden with you. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start uh, this session off with a little bit of a lecture on how to get Bible studies before I go into the question-answer session. Uh, I, I do want to clear up one question that was asked uh, in the earlier session about how long do I prepare for a, uh, a Bible study. And I, I, I think maybe I need to clarify that. When you live, eat, everything Bible study, uh, it, it, it's a lifetime of ministry. I've taught more than 25,000 home Bible studies. Uh, I've taught everybody from A to Z and back again. Uh, I don't call anybody, anybody. I, I will literally teach anybody a Bible study. Uh, I have taught some of the most powerful men in America Bible study. I have also taught the lowest person in the gutter Bible study. Paul said, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And uh, I, I didn't want to imply that you don't have to study or prepare a lesson because if you're just getting started, you, you better know what you're teaching. And uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have uh, tapes of me actually teaching Bible study and our new teachers will listen to a lesson before they have to go teach it to make sure they are prepared. So you do have to prepare a little bit for Bible studies. But uh, on, a, on a given Saturday, I may teach four or five Bible studies just on Saturday. And I go from one to another. Well, obviously, I don't have time to fast and pray for two weeks between Bible studies. But uh, it's been a lifetime. I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. And I intend to do it until um, they shovel dirt in my face. Praise God. So let's talk about, let's talk about how... I get Bible studies. The number one, presently, the number one way that our church gets Bible studies now, and here again, we are matured a long way from the beginning, is that every visitor that visits our church gets a personal call, or we visit that person in person at their home. And uh, we do extensive follow-up visitation. Now, there is no excuse for someone taking their time to come and visit your church without the church having a proper response back. And they came to your church for a reason. Uh, either they was invited, or they are searching, or they have a need, and uh, so... When a person visits our church that week, beginning at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning until Saturday at 3 o'clock, we do visitation, follow-up on every visitor that we have had uh, that pr the previous week. And uh, we have a number of people that do that that are experienced in knowing when to ask them if they would like to have a Bible study in their home. And so uh, the key is not how we get Bible studies, but the key is how do we attract people to visit our church, to fill out a card, and then to follow up on them. The scripture says if you sow abundantly, what will you do? You will reap abundantly. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And so we have had to redefine what abundance is and what sparingly is. Uh, on Saturday, we may knock two or 300 doors. Uh, our bus ministry will knock another three or 400 doors. So on any given week, we may knock from 300 to 600 doors. And to be quite honest with you, 
if I'm going to compare our church with other churches, I would say we have sown abundantly. But we had to redefine that because that's not abundance. In the city of Wichita, in the corporate city limits of Wichita, there is 185,000 residential doors. In the greater metro area of Wichita, which includes the suburbs that join to Wichita, there are 280,000 doors. And so when you look at 280,000 doors compared to 300, you soon learn that that's not abundance. So what we did, I went to a, a direct mail people, and I looked in the phone book, and they have them here also. And uh, I sat down with them, and I said, I would like to send something to every door in our community. So I put together a brochure. It's six by 11 postcard. It's full color on both sides. It has the map to show how to get to our church. Uh, and it's a simple invitation. You are invited. And uh, we have found that there are two areas that people are most interested in, and that's prophecy and healing. Uh, almost everybody needs some kind of healing. And everybody is interested in what's going to happen tomorrow. And so uh, we advertise four Sundays in a row. Like uh, uh, October is our month of prophecy in our church. And so we will advertise the four Sundays that we are preaching uh, that, that month and, and, and name the sermon and so on. Uh, we broadcast it live on the Internet. We stream live. Uh, we, we, we prepare our notes so that the sermon is in note form. When the visitors come, we give them a, a complete copy of the sermon that's going to be preached that Sunday morning. We also give them a, a set of DVDs of the home Bible study. And we give them an, a, other a little gifts for all the visitors that come. And the last time we did it, we mailed out 250,000 invitations in one day and uh, uh, and it holds true you will get approximately listen you'll get approximately one half of one percent response you say that's not very much but uh, uh, in a, a normal October when we do this we will average approximately 250 first-time families will visit our church in the month that we do this. And again, that's not a lot of visitors. That's not people. That's families. And we, we will end up with about 250 visitation cards. And, and, and the following week, we do extensive follow-up, and we try to contact in their home every family that visits our church, and we take our home Bible study chart and we present to them uh, a follow-up on the prophecy that we have taught or uh, invite them to take a Bible study. Out of the 250 families that will visit our church, uh, we, we normally, in a normal uh, year, we will get approximately 60 to 70 home Bible studies. And out of that 60 to 70 home Bible studies, at the end of the year, we will have won from those Bible studies uh, 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 on, a, on a normal year from 12 to 20 uh, families will come into our church as a result of that mass mailing. And so we get a lot of our Bible studies by attracting visitors, doing extensive follow-up on those visitors. And then secondly, we do a door-knocking campaign. Now, every year the door knocking becomes more and more difficult because of the violence in our cities and the unrest. But we still do uh, a door knocking campaign. We prepare our door knocking campaign. And on one Saturday, on one Saturday, I ask our people if they will donate eight hours on one Saturday uh, in a conglomeration, and we will knock 80,000 doors in eight hours. We have 400 people that volunteer 
to knock doors on that one Saturday. We ask each person to knock 200 doors. And we have all the material divided up into packets of 200 brochures. And uh, we divide them up into uh, 40, uh, 40 teams of 10 people on each team. We take the map of Wichita and we slice it up north, south, east, and west into 40 blocks. Now, a block uh, on a map may cover many, many blocks in the city. And each one is given a portion of that map, and that's the area they'll knock on. And we will knock 80,000 doors in eight hours. It takes approximately eight hours walking as fast as you can and praying to God that nobody's at home. <laughs> and, and, uh, but we have a much better response from the door knocking campaign than we do on the direct mail. And so that's two ways that when we are lacking visitors that we enhance our visitor flow uh, to get Bible studies. Now, other ways that we get Bible study is we do what we call relationship evangelism. Now, I know that many of our churches do confrontational evangelism, but I use guerrilla warfare. I camouflage up. I sneak in, I knock them in the head, I drag them out before their pastors ever know they're gone. And, but we do a, a, a relationship. Let me give you an example of relationship evangelism. I am a creature of habit. Uh, when I go to the grocery store, the same lady checks out my groceries every time. I can't hardly stand to go into a different line. It's just, it's just a, it's a hang-up I have. And uh, it's, it's kind of a compulsory disorder. And uh, everybody's got to have some kind of hang-up. Well, I got a couple of them, but that's one of them. And when I, when I gas up, I gas up at the same service station, at the same pump. I, I, I park exactly the same distance from the pump. I wait till my needle gets at an exact certain place on the gauge. And it's just a compulsory disorder that I'm hung up with, but it works for me. And so I went, uh, I, I used this service station, and uh, they have the cage where you go up to pay uh, your bill. This fully had all this automation. And I gas up, I go pay, and the guy behind the glass, he'd just grunt at me. And I never could engage him in a conversation. So one day I pulled up to the full service pump. Now, you, you can't imagine, I, I broke out in cold sweats. I mean, it, it was like I walked into a prison or something. And, and, and then I looked, and they charged 30-something cents a gallon more for gasoline. And I liked they had a conniption. But, but I pulled up the full service station, and I just sat there until he came out of the service station, and he started pumping my gas. Well, I helped him pump my gas. At, at full service, they have to check your oil, so I help him check my oil. And they have to check your tires, so I help him check my tires. He has to wash your windshield, so I help him wash my windshield. He said, if you're going to do all this, why don't you go to the self-service? I said, well, I've been trying for three months to talk to you. And all you've done is grunt. I didn't know you knew how to talk. I said, I, said, I am a preacher. He said, I figured that's what you was. And I said, I just want you to know that I, you need to come to church someplace. He said, well, I don't go to church. I said, well, that's the reason I'm talking to you. You don't go to church. And I started inviting. And so the next time I come up to the full uh, self-service pump, he gets out and pumps my gasoline for me. And we talk every time. And so one day I asked him, was he married? And he said he was. And I said, I'd like to come by and meet your family. And I went to his home, and I took my Bible study chart. I met his wife, and I started a Bible study. I taught them 26 weeks a Bible study. And this is one of those Bible studies. I don't recommend this, but I taught three hours a night every Monday night. And the reason I taught three hours is they would not let me leave. When I got through, they said, are we finished? I said, we're finished. They said, thank you very much. And that was it. The best preacher in Pentecost. 
did not phase them. I stung them with scorpions. I dropped atomic bombs on them. I blowed their brains out and their eyeballs hanging down on the chin where it says that they would seek death and death would flee from them. I burned them in hell. I marched them through the gates of pearl. Thank you very much. I said, okay. And I kept filling my tank up with gas at their service station. One year later, on Sunday morning before church, they walked through the back doors. Mom and dad and two little brats come down and stand right in front of the pulpit. Church has not started. I, I'm sitting over on, in my chair. I, I walk up and said, I said, Lynn, what can I do for you? He said, we're ready. I said, you're what? I said, he said, we're ready. I said, ready for what? He said, we're ready to live for God. I took them, got them dressed for baptism. They come up out of the water speaking in tongues. Three weeks later, three weeks later, this guy, this guy pumps gasoline at a service station. He said, what do y'all do with them buses? I said, we run buses every Sunday, pick up kids. He said, we'd like to do that. I said, you want to be a part of the bus ministry? He said, yes. And so that Sunday night, I said, we need to buy a bus. And a guy in the balcony stood up and said, I'll buy it. I'll pay for it. Bought a bus. We gave it to them. They ran a bus route three weeks after they get baptized. 19 years, almost 20 years. And get a load of this. They averaged over a 20-year period of time bringing 77 a Sunday on their bus. You never know when you win somebody to God that they might change your church. Can I have an amen? amen. And, and, and now we run 25 buses every Sunday, and, and we have had bus drivers and bus captains that have been on the same bus more than 30 years, and they're still at it because they were one to, to God themselves. They got a burden, and they have stuck with their ministry. So when you, when you are uh, in everyday life, you're going to meet people. You've got to be careful that you don't just meet them and pass them on by. You've got to start building relationship with somebody except your little clique. I'm going to meddle now, okay? I reserve the right to meddle in every district. But we are the most cliquish, clannish people in the whole world. When we get out of the world and we get in the church, uh, we, we get a little group that we identify with. And I'm going to tell you what, somebody has to break into your group with a sledgehammer for you to let them in. We need to open some doors in our clique and invite people that are not like us into our little clique and learn how to build some relationship, and we might be better soul winners. Can I have an amen? amen. And, and like anybody ever been to the dentist? Can I see your hand? You've ever been, been to the dentist? I hate dentist. I, I, I like to go to dentist because I love root canals. I went to a dentist, and I didn't. I didn't know that they charged so much, and uh, I thought I got to get my money back. So I said. Uh, uh, you go to church anywhere? And he said, nope. I said, I need to teach you a Bible study. <laughs> Hallelujah. One man said, I'm going to give you a preacher's discount. I said, I don't want a discount. I want a good deal. <laughs> I taught my dentist a Bible study. What about your chiropractor? You ever been to a chiropractor? You know, they're humans. And boy, do they ever more need God. I taught my chiropractor a Bible study. Everywhere you go, 
You need, if you're going to be a soul winner, you got to become a, you got to become conscious of your surroundings because everybody is a candidate for a Bible study. If you can build the right relationship, you can get in their home with a Bible. Can I have an amen? So I, I just sharing a few ways that we get our Bible studies. Uh, Brother Forsythe in our church has taught 32,000 Bible studies. And he is a master of serving people. And when visitors come to our church, uh, he meets them and he visits them. And then he invites people to his house for his wife to cook them a meal and gets better acquainted. And Brother Forsythe is the world's greatest hospitable preacher I've ever known because he's going to build a relationship with you. First of all, he can't preach a lick. He was denied five times from the district board to even get a local license. He's been on my staff full time for 35 years. He's preached three times from my pulpit in 35 years. Boy, that quietened the crowd, didn't it? You say, well, how do you keep him? Because he has identified what his ministry is. His ministry is to be a soul winner. And, and he feels like he does more good at a kitchen table with one couple than he would ever do in a large congregation. Blessed is the man that can identify his calling and do what God has called him to do without being upset because someone else has a different ministry. Can I have an amen? I'm going to stop right here, and I want to have a time of question and answers. And anything that I've covered the last two days or three days or how long I've been here, uh, I'd like to answer questions because many times the questions you have um, are better than what... Yes, sir. I've, I've, I've already done that. I did. Okay. I, I apologize. I, don't, I realize everybody don't have ADHD. And I realize that everybody here has not taught 25,000 Bible studies. And I realize that you may just be getting started. Uh, you need to be well prepared in what you're going to teach. And uh, if you teach it 50 times, you probably won't have to prepare anymore. But you need to be prepared. Each lesson, you need to know what you're going to teach ahead of time. You can listen to a tape of someone that's ever already taught it. You can read the manual. Uh, you can pray and fast. Uh, you, you know how much preparation time that you need. And, and you need to adjust your schedule accordingly, okay? And so I do apologize. I live, breathe, I live and breathe Bible studies. And I've got, I don't even use a chart anymore because I've got all the charts memorized. And, and I paint word pictures uh, for the people, praise God. But I, I will still take my chart to Bible study, but I don't even look at it anymore. But that's because after a while you learn how to get from home to work without knowing what street you're going down. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir. So in a couple of uh, the examples that you gave of when you taught Bible studies, you've mentioned that your wife was there with you. Could you touch a, 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 for a moment on how that team relationship works with you and your wife there and if there's times where you go by yourself? You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, first of all, I recommend that when you start teaching Bible studies, that a husband and wife teach as a team. My wife went to every Bible study for the first 20 years I taught Bible study. And usually she can wrestle the little imps while I teach. Many times uh, my wife will go and she'll teach a Bible study uh, by herself to a lady. Uh, I, I do not recommend at all that a man go into a home where there's only a woman or vice versa. You're asking for trouble. I apologize. I just assumed you already knew that. But uh, always be discreet. Always be discreet. 
Can I have an amen? So husband and wife is the best team. However, uh, I teach a lot of couples in which my wife is not able to go. Uh, if, if I have a couple that has children or uh, unusual circumstances, she'll go with me and she'll corral some of the little demons while I teach. And, and I'll tell you, I have been in some terrible situations where the kids would be tearing the house down around your ears. And my wife, if, if, if that situation comes, I'll take one of my grandchildren with me and they'll wrestle with the kids while I teach. So you have to improvise depending on the Bible study. The main thing is everybody needs experience, okay? Now listen carefully. I don't want to discourage anybody. The first Bible study that I ever taught, uh, I was invited to not come back. I lost the first four Bible studies that I taught because my personality was domineering, dogmatic, forceful, unrelenting, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm just telling you, that's the way, I, I, I thought, if I didn't preach Acts 238, you're going to drop off into hell right then. That's the way I was taught. I had to change my personality. Now listen to me. If you have a sour puss personality, you need to go to the sugar bowl and eat two tablespoons of sugar before you go to Bible study. You, you, need, to, you need to take a good evaluation of your personality. And ask yourself, would you want you to teach you a Bible study? I had a preacher preach me one time, and he said, how did I do tonight? I said, you want me to be honest, or do you want to be honest yourself? I said, let me get you the tape, and I want you to sit down, and I want you to sit at a table, and I want you to watch one hour of the biggest mess I've ever heard. I made him listen to his own sermon. I had a young man who wanted to marry one of the girls in my church. And he was a big time preacher in another district. And I said, well, I said, I think you need to spend one year here and learn how to preach before you marry this girl. He said, I already know how to preach. I said, no, you know how to preach to Pentecostals. You know all the jargon and all the cliches of holy rollers. And I said, you need to come here one year and let me teach you how to preach to sinners. And you know what? He came and spent one year. He changed every form of his preaching. When he went evangelizing, I, I became his accountability and I refused to let him preach to the church. I made him preach only to sinners. He had a breakthrough in his evangelism and became one of the sought-after evangelists on the field because he preached to sinners. We, need, we can change our personality if we'll recognize that maybe it's my personality why I'm not winning people. Maybe I shouldn't have talked about that. Can I have an amen? If you're a know-it-all, you need to unlearn everything you know. That won't take very long. You need to learn to be kind, gracious, forgiving. You need to learn to overlook other people's faults. I, I, I taught a Bible study uh, in, a, in a home of some Indians from India. And uh, like an idiot, I'm just going to walk in their house. And the lady just, <gasps> and I stopped. I said, is there something that I don't know here? She said, we pull our shoes off at the door. 
And I had to, I had to teach that Bible study in my socks. I'm not going to offend them over something that does not matter. Can I have an amen? All right. Change your personality. Change your attitude. Learn to be kind. And if you'll practice being kind uh, to people you're teaching Bible study to, it might affect how your husband loves you. Or your wife. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir. Ask the question the microphone. If God sent you to talk to somebody who like speaks a different language, how would you go about doing that? I, we have a large Spanish population and a large Filipino population in our city. And uh, sometimes I teach a Bible study through an interpreter. Like uh, we have a, a, an immigrant from Colombia, uh, from uh, uh, Medellin, uh, Colombia, uh, and she barely speaks English. She can't really understand it, and she doesn't speak it very well. And we're teaching her a Bible study, and we're having to teach through an interpreter. And we have a large Filipino uh, contingency, and we have won over 155 Filipinos. And, and many of them uh, came to America to teach math in our schools. And we have a Filipino lady that made contact with them. And we have won 15 of those families that came to America to, speak, uh, to teach math. And, and we literally had to teach them how to speak English. But we had to teach them Bible study through an interpreter. So you teach Bible studies any way you can, okay? More questions. Yes, ma'am. Right, right here, right behind you. Okay, we'll get to you in just a second. I mean, that's why I saw it first. When you are teaching a Bible study and you're in the deliverance, where you're teaching the Old Testament stories, uh -huh. do you um, make those life applications about areas of bondage Explicit? No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't bring up bondage to them at all. I know they're in bondage. Right, but um, when you say like this story is a story about forgiveness, uh -huh. do you say that explicitly, or just let the work of the Holy Ghost? I let the work of the Holy Ghost do it. I don't say, okay, I'm gonna teach you on forgiveness because you're bound by unforgiveness. <laughs> I don't do right, that. Right. I I know what their bondage is, but if I don't know what their bondage is, I just teach the stories and watch their response. You've got to learn to, to, to observe the people that you're teaching to find out how they're responding. Right, right. Okay. With, also in tandem with that, do you make the connections between Old Testament and New Testament at that time? For uh, example, like Noah's Ark and Jesus being yes, the way? Yes, uh, I, will, I will go back and forth between Old and Testament as, as the charts show, okay. like uh, the, uh, as it was in days of Noah. So shall be. And I'll... I, I'll I don't try to preach the New Testament. I'll just show the correlation, and then I, I move on. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Have you ever taught a Bible study to a religious Jewish person, one, and two? When you talk to people who are Christians of other denominations, uh -huh. do you have a different method when you're dealing with people who are devoted that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, I had a, a boy call me, and uh, his name is James Cohen, and he, was, he is Jewish. And he said, a friend said that I should co contact you and talk to you. And so I met with him, and over something completely different, I invited him to take a Bible study, and I taught him a Bible study. And he was Jewish in ever since the word. And, of course, uh, they believe in one God. We believe in one God. We have something in common. But I started in Genesis, worked all the way up through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He agreed with everything I said because they believe the Old Testament. And I, I began to blend it into the New Testament, and I won him to God, and now he is my neighbor and pastor. So uh, people are people, okay? And, and if you build a relationship and when I say something, and you agree with it, I want you to nod your head, okay? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Noah built the ark. 
uh, Abraham was called a God. I get, I start off getting people to agree with me. They think I'm the world's greatest preacher because I don't preach nothing that they disagree with. And I get them good and agreeing with me, then I'll slip something in that they need to know. You don't want to start off your Bible study with an argument. If I'm teaching a Baptist, uh, I don't say, now, if you're going to get saved, you've got to be baptized. This accepting Christ is for the dogs. I don't do stuff like that. Uh, I, I agree with the Baptists on a lot of stuff. I believe that the Bible has two testaments. <laughs> you can't take a person to the next step until you know what step he's on. And so if I'm teaching a, a denominal person, I start in Genesis. I, I, I said, I want to teach you a Bible study. And we're going to work our way through the Bible. Like Rosie Hughes that taught at St. Mary's Baptist Church. She wanted to take a Bible study so she'd know how to better teach her Sunday school class. And I started in Genesis, and I gave her a lot of stuff to teach for her Baptist Sunday school class. And, and she liked it so much, she started bringing her Baptist Sunday school class into the Bible study. And it took many, 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 many weeks by giving them bite-sized bits I, I don't get in a hurry to finish a Bible study. Now, obviously, if they are very settled in their denomination, you're going to come to a place of disagreement. And how you handle that disagreement and the personality of both of you will determine the success of that Bible study. And I, I will do my best to do it in such a way as to not be offensive. I'll give you an example. The Southern Baptists in our city have a lot of churches, and we have outgrown all of them. Well, the president of the Southern Baptist Church of the Kansas-Nebraska district called me. And the reason he called me was, we have 25 buses. We loan our buses to every Christian school in town. We loan our buses to the Air National Guard. We loan our buses to the police department and the fire department. We loan our buses every summer to all of the youth camps in Wichita. On any given week, we may have eight or ten of our buses on the street that people are using free of charge. Now, eight of the public high schools use our buses free of charge for their field trips because the bus company charges $200 a field trip. And when they don't have the money, they borrow our buses. And I have made it known that any nonprofit group in our city, a Christian school, the police department, fire department, Air National Guard, anybody can use our buses. Well, you know, you build up a reputation for serving people. And, and, and so these Baptist schools use our buses free of charge, and they can't cuss us because they're using us. Why well, make enemies out of people? Y'all missed a point there. Why well, make enemies out of people? And so he said, all the preachers like you, and, and we want to try to find out how you're growing. I said, Bible studies? He said, what do you mean? I told him. He said, can I attend one of your Bible studies? I said, sure. So I took him to one of my Bible study groups to observe. When I got through the Bible study that night, we, I got up and went to the counter to get a dessert and coffee, and I came back. Him and his wife, Tears are just running down their face. And I thought I'd offended him. I said, did I offend y'all? He said, no, 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 you didn't offend us. He said, we didn't come to this Bible study to enjoy it. We came to observe. And he said, this is the best thing we've ever been in in our life. 
He said, I learned more in one hour than I ever learned in a Bible college classroom. I, I, I just want to make a point here. I wanted to minister to them. I didn't try to convert him. But I tell you what, from that point on, we became the best of friends. And I converted people right out of his church. Can I have an amen? All right, more questions. Yes, ma'am. How's everybody? Um, my question is, um, once the, you know, we've, we keep hearing about the bondage and the, the point of decision. Uh -huh. And my mind is going back to a personal, my personal experience. And I remember when I met my pastor and first lady, my bondage was speaking out. Uh -huh. They spoke to them. Uh -huh. And they didn't say anything, but they, they gave me a Bible study. I had already had the Holy Ghost in my particular uh -huh. And was baptized in Jesus' name. But this area. And so they gave me a Bible study that spoke to that area. And then once I was set free, I just spent, like, all this money to change that particular area. Because I didn't have the wisdom. I just knew that I was set free. Uh -huh. And I wanted to keep activating my freedom. Uh -huh. But I didn't have the wisdom that I didn't have to do it that way. So once a person has come to that point of decision and they are released from their bondage, uh -huh. then how do we put it in words so that they can understand, okay, this is the next step that you do now? Okay, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I start teaching a Bible study, I just teach the word, okay? Systematic and chronological. I don't announce to them, I'm searching for your bondage. But I know from experience that there's a reason why they're not saved. I know from experience that they are in the world. I know from experience that there's all kinds of spirits out there. And I have to, since I'm not a spiritual person, I don't know what their bondage is. And there's more bondages besides alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. There's proud spirits, arrogant spirits, sinful spirits, religious bondage, all kinds of stuff. But as I teach that word, and I'm teaching these stories as they are in the Bible, that word is going to attack whatever bondage there is in their life. And I let the word bring them to that point of decision. Now, when they come to that point of decision, it's usually visible. You can usually tell that the word is affecting them. Now, it doesn't always happen in the first Bible study or the second or third. It may be eight or nine weeks down the road before the bondage is broke loose from them and they're having to deal with it. Like they may be struggling, for instance, their grandma was not Pentecostal, and she died. Uh, what happened to her? Or uh, uh, maybe they are a good person, and, and, and they, they're not really sinners, and, and they're struggling with all of a sudden they're face-to-face -face with the fact that they're, they were born in sin. And all of a sudden, the Word starts revealing things that they've done that they didn't know was sin before. Maybe they're living together unmarried. And maybe they was very adulterous before they got in Bible study. Or maybe they were fornicators. I've taught a, a family one time that wasn't married, and, and they live a very sinful lifestyle that I didn't know about. And, and as I taught them, and I got all the way to the Ten Commandments in Exodus. So, you know, I've taught 10 or 12 weeks before I get to Exodus. And I talk about deliverance out of Egypt and going to, to Mount Sinai and God going to make, bringing Moses to the mount and giving them the Ten Commandments. And I just started quoting the Ten Commandments. And I got to the place where thou shalt not commit adultery. And it got real quiet. They didn't even know they was committing adultery. It 
It's a lifestyle that the world no longer accepts as sin anymore. Folks, we live in a different world. And you can't just say you're living in adultery. They'll laugh you out of, out of the house because that's what everybody's doing. And all of a sudden, God revealed to them how sinful they were. It was traumatic. They said, oh my God, you're telling me that we're going to hell. I said, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You said, thou shalt not commit adultery. We're not even married. I said, y'all are not married? Here is the holiest guy in Pentecost in y'all's house and you're not married? And I had to work through that for three or four weeks and and. And had to wait for them to go get a license. And I married them right there in their own house. Uh, you, you know, uh, I, I don't know what, how they do it in Maryland. But we, they don't buy marijuana in Wichita. They raise it. <laughs> I prayed a couple through from Kansas State University. They were educated people. And, and he wore a, a, a red bandana around his head, and she wore a red bandana around that old straggly red hair she had. I mean, she wore combat boots. She was something else. And uh, I said, what kind of lifestyle did y'all come out of? She worked in a, a steel foundry, picking up 100-pound bars of steel and putting it over her head. On a rack. And they'd go in a bar room at night. They needed extra money. They'd go in a bar room at night. He'd stand up on a chair and say, All right, my wife can whip anybody in this room. And they'd put a table in the middle of the room and she'd arm wrestle them. Well, my God, she'd been picking up 100 pound bars of steel and putting over her head. And she'd put grown men down a buck at a time. She was one tough woman. I loved her because she was a soul winning machine. She'd grab people by the nap of the neck and drag them to the house of God. <laughs> we called her Sister Go Go. When she got saved, she decided she wanted to play a horn on our platform. I'm talking about one of these horns that goes round and round and round and it comes out real big. I don't know what it's called. I looked at that horn. And it was so dented up. I don't know where she got it from. But I found out why it was dented. Because one goose pimple would pop out on her neck and she thought that was the Holy Ghost. And she sat on our platform. She wore combat boots. She didn't shave her legs. You know, I'm talking about hairy-legged boys, but this is a hairy-legged woman. I put a blanket in her lap to cover up her hairy legs. <laughs> we have nuts in Wichita. <laughs> and she'd feel one goose pimple, and she'd throw that horn down on the floor, and she'd throw that blanket off, and she would bunny hop all the way around the church. And all you could do was wait for her to make the round trip. You say, I wouldn't let her do that when she's bringing in people by the score, you will. She embarrassed us many a time, praise God. Okay, another question. Brother Sean, back here, right back in the back, back here. I feel the Holy Ghost here, okay? The Lord wants all of us to be involved in Bible study. And I want to I want to take away as many of your fears as you've got, okay? But Amen. I think I can speak for everybody and say we've this has been so enjoyable. Thank you so much for you. spending your time with us. And I have a lot of questions, but I'll, you're answering them all as you go. 
and I appreciate that. I do want to just give a shout out to you if you don't mind. Okay. And it's really designed to, to help some of my people that are here so that when we go back, we're not overwhelmed with your success because of your tenure. And you're making it sound extremely easy. And the reality is, I think when we get sitting across from somebody, all of a sudden it doesn't sound so easy. About 10 years ago, um, the Lord put a young lady in my wife's path, and it was obvious she was supposed to teach this young lady a Bible study. And um, she didn't really know where to go and how to do that. And so we found a set of your tapes. <laughs> this, is, this is cassette tapes. <laughs> and so this is what I want to tell everybody in this room, and, and maybe this isn't my place, but this is what I feel like I want to just comment because the practicality is the hard part. The inspiration of what we're getting is incredible. And so uh, this was back when you um, took a couple, put them on your platform, and on Sunday nights taught them a brand new couple in front of your entire congregation, and you taped it, and then you made those tapes available. And so my wife would listen to lesson one, and then she would go and teach lesson one using all your examples, <laughs> using your uh, formula, using the extra pieces that you would put in. And she did that all the way through the entire study. And that, that lady is now married, and they're running our summer program wow. with our children and in charge of our guest reception at our church. So you've updated that. You've gone from cassette tapes to videotapes. Amen. And it's actually now on YouTube. Amen. So I, would, I think we should buy them and not just do the YouTube part. But um, what I, my... I give those tapes away, by the way. But we put them on YouTube so I wouldn't have to keep reproducing them. But uh, I've, I've got two sets of videos, which I do the stand-up version of the Bible study over a 20-week period. Then I have where I taught this couple on my platform for 15 lessons. And they're all on the YouTube uh, on my website. And you can download any of that free of charge. And on the 20th uh, lesson series, the last tape is 257 pages of notes. And you can download that free of charge. So my, my point is, is that I think, I think everybody in this room, including myself, can leave here today being inspired to do it. But also he's provided the practicality to do it. And we can imitate him and actually go and do the study. And I really appreciate that very much. very much. Thank you. I realize that it's very difficult to get started. And I've tried to use as many examples as I possibly can. But the truth of the matter is, when you're in that home by yourself, you've got to enjoy what you're doing. Quit being under pressure to win people. And be only under pressure to want to minister to people. And if you, if you will major on, how can I minister to this person? Everybody wants power and authority, okay? The greatest power and the greatest authority comes through service. The more you become a servant, the more... Of, you, you, can't, you can't usurp authority and be effective. But power through servitude is awesome. Brother Libby, I appreciate uh, you, those comments. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Wait, let her. I want to get the question on, on, the, on the microphone here. The single young lady that she was talking to me about, I don't know where she's located, but I told her to asked the question, but she wanted to know about ministering. She feel called to do this, uh -huh. um, but she wanted to know about ministering to families as a single person to keep her, you know, being right, looking uh, let right. Me, let me share. So that's a great question, okay? Uh, our, our, our young people from 17 to 22 or 23, they are so effective with older people. And our old people are so effective with these younger people. I have an African-American lady. She couldn't win an African-American person if she tried. 
but she brings in white people in by the droves. And I have, I have white people that are very effective in the African American community. I have Spanish people that they couldn't win a Spaniard if they could spell it. But they are effective with other people. And, and I, what I think, what I'm saying is, everybody is an individual, and you've got to work with people that you are comfortable with. I had a little girl. Uh, I'd done a seminar, and there's a little girl in my church. She was only like nine years old, ten years old. And uh, when I got through the seminar, she went to school, and she told her teacher, she announced to her teacher, she said, I want to teach a Bible study to my classroom. Well, obviously, legally, she could not do that. So she wasn't satisfied with that. She went to the principal. She said, I want to teach a Bible study to my class. He said, well, we can't do that, but here's what we can do. You can come to school an hour before church or an hour, I mean, a school, or an hour after school, and we, you can teach a Bible study before class. We can loan you a room. She did. Would you believe she was in one of the most troubled schools in our city? And she, this, this girl, 10 years old, started teaching a Bible study an hour before class before school started, and the kids started flocking out. And she filled that classroom up, and she taught them the Bible study. I got a letter in my files. I got a letter in my files that the principal wrote me a letter. And she said, Dear Pastor, she said, Ashley goes to your church, and she is in our school. She said, We had a very troubled school. And this little girl started teaching a Bible study an hour before class, and she filled her classroom up, and she said, what we could not do as an administration or a school district, this girl has brought peace to our school. It's very important. Listen, of everything I say, please listen to me. Fall in love with people. Not ministry. Don't do this to build your ministry. you got to do this because you, you have a genuine burden to help somebody else. Can I have an amen? All right, I, I got time for about one more question. Yes, ma'am. Right here. So if I'm in the midst of a Bible study now and I'm on like lesson four uh -huh. and I really didn't communicate, I communicated that it was a 12-week Bible study, how would you say I should kind of like... Expand it? Yes. You're or telling me it's a 12-week Bible study, but you realize you're not making as much progress as you'd like to make. You say, look, I know this is supposed to be a 12-week Bible study, but I'm not covering material. Would you like to go a little bit longer? So what, for example, I've already passed Joseph and... Oh, I, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like I've, I'm already on lesson four and I've been going chart by chart based on not really like having the time to like go in like you've been describing you, today. What I would do is I would start reviewing. I would review lesson one, okay. two, three, and four. And, and when I went back the next week, I'd review one, two, three, four, and five. And I would just add little things that you missed out. Okay. Okay. And slow down. Don't try to teach them according to chart one, lesson one, chart two. Don't try to finish a lesson. Just teach 55 minutes and stop. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Do you have a question? All right, one more question. I hope you, they'll be able to, I have three, and I think you might be able to answer okay. them relatively quick. First question, you mentioned you wanted to save your family. Were you able to um, do that? Were you able to minister to your family and lead them to, to a life of, of what we believe is? You're talking about your family. You mentioned, you, t you saw the vision of the angels pulling, uh, and you, have you to, wanted to save you your family. I want your time, okay? Well, uh, Sister Corn, I, uh, I make dates with her. 
Uh, I'm busy, but uh, I'm still in love. And I still think she's the most beautiful person in the whole world. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I want to get the kids gone. Thank God for empty nest syndromes. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, 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 like I'm here, I'm going to be in Wisconsin, Mississippi. Uh, I'm going all over the country. Uh, I make sure that I do not neglect my wife. Mm-hmm. And when she can't go with me, of course, I make time for her. And all the things that goes on, make time for your family. And your parents, were you ever able to minister? All of my parents are gone now. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't neglect my family. Uh, my mother and father listen to everything I've ever preached on tape. And uh, we communicate, okay? Uh, I don't recommend that you teach 15 Bible studies a week unless you are full-time. If you're full-time, go for it. But at the most, two Bible studies a week. At the most. If you get one Bible study and you can learn to build it into a nice group, that's even better. You cannot neglect your family because that's the most valuable Bible study you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also witnessing to a a very, a, a Jewish lady who will not write out or doesn't believe you should write out the full word of God. You leave, they leave out the middle, the O. And so when I'm texting her or talking to her, I, I feel kind of hesitant to write out. Like, I will, I'll write to her and I'll leave out the O if I say something about God to, out of respect because that's what she does. When you were teaching a Bible study to the Jewish gentleman, was that an issue that ever came up? One of the things that I did, I, I, and I mentioned the other day, I have a book entitled Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. It's a book on apologetics. It has about uh, 25 or 30 prophecies, long portions of Scripture, and he's researched uh, when the prophecy was given, who gave it, who he gave it to, the fulfillment dates, and how it was fulfilled. And and fulfilled prophecy validates the Bible. And 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 this Jewish guy had the same problem. They they believed in portions of the Scripture but didn't believe in it. Uh, And and I used this book on apologetics to prove the word of God was correct. It took a long time, and that's where you have to slow down, communicate, and wait for God uh, to move upon their life before they're going to be converted. But I I use everything in my power to reach this young man, and and that's one of the books I used. And I, I I went through a study of all these prophetic uh, passages showing where they were fulfilled historically uh, they were prophesied in the scripture how they was fulfilled historically and I had to prove that the Bible was the word of God and that took some time um, but she I don't know if I made it clear by my question she when she writes the the, the word God G-O-D she doesn't write the O she will put G-D because they don't, they believe it's disrespectful to write. She believes in her temple uh, they, that they don't write out the word of God, G O D, the actual literal yeah, word God. Yes, uh, you have, you have. It's the same way with Muslims or Jewish people. They all have a semantics and hung up on different things. That's where your personality and your care. You you have to keep ministering to them until you break down that wall. It's a bondage, is what it is. Okay. My last question, you, last night you talk, taught about the seven types of revival. Seven kinds of revivals. Yes. Do they have to happen in that order? One no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, those revivals are listed depending on what revival the church needs. Uh, one of the mistakes that most of us make is that years ago we had a revival. We had a large group of people come in. And we keep trying to repeat that same kind of revival. When, when that may not be the revival you need. Right now, in our city, what's working is a revival of word. And, and, and so we have moved out of our sanctuary into our fellowship hall around tables and chairs. Uh, our fellowship hall, you can see 360 at tables and chairs. I bring in a teacher uh, and let him teach for five nights. Instead of having revival on Sunday, we have it Monday through Friday. 
I call it Bible college. And we don't have any preliminaries. There's no singing. We don't take up an offering. Uh, I get up. I pray for one minute. I turn it to our Bible teacher. He teaches on his subjects that he's going to teach that week for two hours. And we dismiss, come back the next night, at like a Bible college classroom. They can bring their coffee, their pop, their sandwiches, whatever they want to do. It's a classroom. And usually by Thursday night, he's taught so much of the word that the Holy Ghost falls. And we, we invite our community to come just to the Bible college free of charge. And we have converted more people in those Bible colleges than we have in revival services. It's a different kind of revival. It's a revival of nothing but word. And it's working for us. So those seven revivals, they not, may not necessarily be in that order. If you've got a prejudiced church, you may need a persecution revival. You know? Uh, if you can't get visitors, you may need the angelic revival. Whatever you need. Okay. One... This guy is always trying to shut me down. <laughs> okay, let me, let me express my appreciation for your love for Bible studies. And I thank you for such a wonderful crowd that has been here so much. I, I want to thank you for allowing me to share a burden with you. Thank you very much.